So today I wanted to talk with you about how to interpret NMR spectra. We are going to be taking NMR spectra for our compounds as we go through and complete the experiments in this lab series. So we needed to learn a little bit about the background of NMR and how we're going to use an NMR spectra to determine what our compounds are. So let's talk about the basics of NMR. For the most part, we'll be dealing with hydrogen NMR in this course. So what that means is that we're going to be looking for where the hydrogens are within a molecule. Now, if you recall, remember when we're dealing with organic compounds, hydrogen is usually paired up with a carbon atom. And if we know the structure of the carbon atoms, we can usually indicate what the skeletal structure is for the molecule itself. But remember that hydrogens aren't only present on carbon atoms. So we can also see hydrogens that are present on hetero atoms, such as nitrogen, oxygen, and a couple other different common structures that we run into and common functional groups that we run into in organic chemistry. But for the most part, we'll be dealing with hydrogen NMR. Now, when we're dealing with hydrogen NMR, we're gonna be looking at the protons that are present within that molecule, specifically the protons that are present in a hydrogen nucleus. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along. Now, what can this tell us? So it's gonna tell us two things. Once we get a spectrum, it's gonna tell us how many hydrogens there are at a specific location and how many hydrogens are next door to that specific location. And so we're gonna be talking a lot about things called integration and peak position. And we're also gonna be talking about splitting. So splitting, integration, and peak position are all gonna be things that we need to use to put together our puzzle pieces. Now, what I'm talking about with puzzle pieces is that as we're going through and looking at the spectrum, we're going to start to see common repeated structural motifs. And what I mean is this. So if you look at the bottom right hand side of the slide, you'll see there's an NMR spectrum for ethyl bromide. Now, an ethyl group is a very common structural motif that you see that's present in a lot of different organic molecules. And an ethyl group is going to show up in pretty much the same kind of splitting pattern. In the blue and the pink, you see that there are four peaks in blue and three peaks in red. And so we call those a quartet and a triplet, respectively. And so when we see a quartet and a triplet, we're going to be indicating, or we're going to have it indicated to us, that there's probably an ethyl group present somewhere within our molecule. Now we're going to see other common splitting patterns for other common structural motifs, such as isopropyls or t-butyls, if we have an alcohol functional group present, or if we have carboxylic acids, or aldehydes, or aromatic hydrogens, or some of these very common structural motifs that we see in a lot of molecules, what we're going to try and do is try and recognize those different NMR splitting patterns and in peak positions and integrations that go together to make those specific puzzle pieces. Once we have all the puzzle pieces, we're going to come together and then we're going to put together the Lewis structure for that molecule. If you look at the top of this slide on the right hand side, we see a schematic of what an NMR actually is. At the top, we see a, a sample tube, right? This is the sample that you guys will create in the lab with your compounds that you isolate. And you're going to be basically placing that into a magnet, right? And the magnet there is then attached to a detector and some RF transmitters and the controller. And we'll talk a little bit about how this all goes together. But essentially, when we put our molecule within a magnetic field, it causes our uh, uh, atoms to align in a specific way. And then we can add some energy into that system. And as things relax back to where they started, we can detect a peak signal coming off of that. And that's what we see in our NMR spectrum. Back at the bottom, before we go to the next slide, please take note that if we read our spectrum from left to right, it goes all the way to zero on the right hand side. So it's a little bit backwards from what you might be looking at. So zero is on the right hand side and uh, the larger numbers go off to the left. So let's say that I have a compass and it's pointing north. And so in red, it's pointing north and black is the south end of it. If I take that compass and I forcibly push the needle of the compass to face in the opposite direction. So I take my compass that's normally pointing north and I forcibly push the needle to face in the opposite direction. It's gonna take energy to do that. 
right? It's going to take energy to push that compass to align itself in the opposite direction of what it wants to do, right? Normally compasses, right, they want to align with the magnetic field that the Earth exhibits, right? So it's going to take energy to flip that alignment. If I let go of that compass needle, it's going to spin back around, right? And it's going to align with the Earth's magnetic field, and there's going to be a release of energy when that happens, right? So it's going to take energy to forcibly spin my magnetic uh, uh, compass, right? And it's going to release energy when I let go of that. Now, if I take that same idea and I go look at a nucleus, right, a proton, so a proton has a spin and it has a charge, okay? And if you go through your physics course, you're going to learn what happens if we have a spin and we have a charge. Essentially, what it means is that we're going to have a magnetic moment that forms, right? So if I take my nucleus, right? And if it's spinning in a certain direction, we're going to have a magnetic moment, okay? So in green and the dark green there, we have a magnetic moment of our nucleus of our proton. And if we have that same nuclei, or nucleus, I should say, and it's spinning in the opposite direction, then our magnetic moment's going to be facing in the opposite direction there. Now, if I take my molecules, my atoms, and I put them in an external magnetic field. So in black, if we have an external field. What's going to happen is my nuclei is either going to line up with or against that external field. So I have my nucleus here, right? Here's my two nuclei. And what happens is if my magnetic moment is aligned with that external field, it's going to end up being at the lower energy situation than if it's aligned against. Okay, so we have an energy situation, right? We have an energetic situation where we have a lower energy situation when it's aligned with and a higher energy situation when it's aligned against. If I want to move my nucleus and want it to spin in the opposite direction, I'm going to have to add energy into this, right? I'm going to have to add energy into my nucleus for it to spin in the opposite direction. And eventually that nucleus is going to relax right, and we'll call this relax, it's going to relax back down into the lower energy state, and it's going to release that energy. So that relaxed energy there in orange is something that we can measure. We can detect this release of energy when a molecule, excuse me, when a nucleus goes back to uh, the, the, the alignment with the external field, and that's what we detect when we're going through and looking at an NMR spectrum. The change in energy between those red lines there, between the aligned uh, nuclei, as we go through this different alignment with and against, and the energy that's released as we translate in between those two states, is what we can detect with an NMR. So we discussed on the previous slide about how the nucleus can exist in two different spin states, either aligned with or against uh, an externally applied magnetic field. But we have to think about the electrons, which are the other part of an atom. So if we have a nucleus and we have the electrons which are orbiting around that nucleus, right? and let's, uh, let's say that we have electrons that are orbiting around that nucleus. Now, moving electrons, they generate a magnetic field. Any moving particles are going to generate a magnetic field, essentially. And so depending on which way they move, either to the right or the left, essentially what's going to happen is they're going to generate a magnetic field. And if we are moving in one direction versus the other following the right hand rule, we can figure out which way the uh, magnetic field is going to be uh, generated based off of the movement of those electrons. So just, on the, just like on the previous slide, let's say that we now take that atom that we just drew and we have an external magnetic field again. So, so external field. And we place that atom that we just drew within this magnetic field. So there's our nucleus. And we will just draw in that magnetic field from the electrons. Okay. And so what happens is the magnetic field generated by the electrons essentially opposes or cancels out part of that external field. And so in orange, what we kind of have is the net magnetic field. So the black external field minus the red field from the electrons basically generates our, our, our net 
magnetic field that the atom is feeling, right? So the black minus the red is going to be equal to the orange there. And so what we call this is this atom would then be shielded. So our electrons shield our nucleus from part of that external field. So the more electrons you have around a nucleus, the more it's going to shield or cancel out some of that external field. The less electrons you have around that nucleus, the more it's going to feel that it's the more it's going to feel that external field. So let's think about this for just a second. So let's say we have let's have a, a generic NMR spectra here. So when we see an NMR spectra, we're just basically going to see peaks that look just essentially like this. Right? And if you remember on the previous slide, we start from zero on the left hand side and we go something all the way down to 12 or 14. Right. So moving uh, uh, moving right to left, right from zero to a greater number. So over on the larger numbers, so down here, this is our D shielded. Okay, so this is our D shielded or our down field. That's another way of saying it. So the larger the number, right, the larger our parts per million, our PPM, right, that's going to be our D shielded area of our NMR spectrum. The closer we are to zero, this is our shielded. So depending on how many electrons there are and the magnetic field that they uh, produce by their movement, that's going to affect where on an NMR spectrum our peaks show up. So now how is this going to affect or tell us some of these puzzle pieces that we need to know? Well, remember, we're going to be looking at a variety of different atoms. And we have to always think about our electronegativity. And we also have to think about aromatic rings. These are going to be two of the big puzzle pieces that we can figure out from whether we have shielded or de-shielded protons. And they're going to affect where our peaks show up on an NMR spectrum, either shielding, which means we have a lot of electron density, or deshielding, where we have less electron density that are around our nucleus. So now knowing the background that we have about the spin in the nucleus and the effect of electrons, let's talk about actually looking at the hydrogens within a molecule. So if we start with a simple molecule like pentane. What we need to pay attention to is that only uh, hydrogens that exist in unique locations are going to show up as an independent signal. And so that's coming from the fact that our molecules are basically tumbling around and they're rotating in solution while we're doing an NMR. And so on the time scale of the NMR experiment, what's going to happen is we're going to end up seeing equivalent positions or equivalent hydrogens. And so here's how we can start to take a look at this. If we look at pentane, we can start to fill in where all of our hydrogens are. So I'm going to go through and draw in all these hydrogens. And we've got methyl groups in green that are at the end. We've got methylene groups in red, and we've got another methylene group in blue. So when we're talking about equivalent hydrogens, we're talking about chemical equivalents. So the methyl groups, I'll just highlight them here in green, right? The methyl groups at the end here, these are essentially the same, right? They're in the same environment. All three of those hydrogens are in the same environment. And the location of that methyl group is there's nothing different between one versus the other. So these two are going to show up as one signal. All right, they're going to show up as one set of peaks or one signal. And these methylene groups are the same thing too. Right? So they're going to end up showing up as one signal. And that uh, the blue set of hydrogens here, same thing also, one signal. Now take note that between the red and the blue hydrogens there, there is a difference between those. They are methylene groups. Right? They both are CH2 groups, but they're in a different environment. Right? The red methylene groups are next to a methyl, while the blue are just next to two methylene groups. So they are different. So it kind of works like this. If I can take a highlighter here. So if I highlight this half of the molecule, right? if I highlight this half of the molecule, you'll see how that half of the molecule is the same as the non-highlighted half. 
right? So there's a plane of symmetry that runs in between this molecule here, which makes one half the same as the other. And then these equivalent hydrogens in each one of those halves is just going to show up as one set of signals. So let's continue um, going through a couple more uh, examples here. So let me just give myself some space. All right, let's erase this here a little bit. So the best way to get used to doing or looking for these equivalent positions is by just running through some practice. And so as you guys are doing your practice for the tests or for your, for your lab here, you guys are going to get used to seeing these equivalent positions. Oops, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> All right, back, here we go. Okay. All right, so let's change to an alcohol group here then. Okay, so here's our molecule. Let's start to fill in where our hydrogens are. All right, we have that group there. We have that group there. All right, that group here. Then we have our methyl at the end there. And so if we take a look at this, right, each set of those hydrogens is unique. There is no more symmetry that's within this molecule, right? So from the, uh, we have one signal here, one signal here, one signal here, and one signal here, right, from those unique sets of hydrogens. But don't forget that, that the proton that's on the alcohol there is also going to show up as one signal. So we have a total of five signals that are going to show up from this molecule here, right? There is no more of that internal plane of symmetry there that makes equivalent positions, okay? So if we, do, if we take this molecule here, right, I'm just going to erase a little bit. Let's say that instead of a methyl group at the end, say instead of that methyl group at the end, let's say that we have another alcohol over here on that end there. So now we ended up introducing a plane of symmetry, right? So now we see that this half over here is the same as the other half that's not highlighted. So that means that again, we have to go back and take a look at these equivalent hydrogen positions. So what that means is that what was in purple here, these hydrogens, now because we added that alcohol back in on the other side, so now these are equivalent positions. Whoops, I meant that to be in red. So now these two here are equivalent, so they're going to show up as one signal. The green down here is going to show up as one signal. And then don't forget about our alcohols here as one signal. So the previous molecule that we looked at had five total signals. Here we have three. So doing a simple change there to add some symmetry into our molecule does affect what's going to happen with our NMR, uh, with our NMR spectrum. So we're going to continue doing some experiments. Excuse me, we're going to continue doing some examples on the next slides here. So let's continue our discussion about symmetry and equivalent hydrogens and positions. So let's say we have this molecule here. And we have a chlorine there. So now we have a chiral center. So now we have to pay attention to where our unique hydrogens and equivalent hydrogen positions are. So let's go through and mark the unique or chemically equivalent hydrogen. So we have that methyl group on that end. That's going to be unique. This hydrogen, excuse me, these hydrogens here in blue, they're a methyl group also, but they're right next door to the chiral carbon. So they're different from the other methyl group. And here next door, we are going to have two inequivalent hydrogens. So whenever we have a, let me just draw that a little bit neater. So whenever we have a chiral center, we have to pay attention to what's next door. So our methylene hydrogens are not going to be equivalent next to here. So even though we have free rotation around that bond, those hydrogens are actually going to end up showing as separate peaks when you're going through and looking at your NMR spectrum. And then don't forget about your red hydrogen there on the chiral center also. That's going to be a unique hydrogen. So in total, we're going to have, let me switch colors here, one, two, three, four, five signals that come out of that, of this molecule. Let's take a look at our benzene ring. Six-membered ring. Remember with benzene, 
we have the alternating pi bonds here that form our aromatic pi system. So that's one way of drawing benzene, but remember it has uh, the resonance structures. So in reality, to make it a little bit easier for what we're doing, let's draw it with that circle there in the middle, right? So there's our buddy benzene. Now, if we're just looking at benzene and plain old benzene, these hydrogens are all the same, right? All six of those hydrogens are the same. So it's only gonna show up as one signal. But let's take a look at what can happen as we start to substitute some of the other hydrogens for different functional groups. So here's a benzene again. Let's put methyl groups here, right? So we have a di substituted, a para substituted benzene ring. And let's take a look at what happens, right? So the methyl groups, right? Those are gonna be equivalent. Hopefully what you're starting to notice at this point is that we start to see symmetry mirror planes. So we see that there's a mirror plane in that benzene ring in that orange dotted line. Now you're like, hang on a second, Dr. Hillis, I'm right. The, 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 the methyl groups are pointing in opposite directions. Well, remember, that's just the way we draw it. There's free rotation. So we could have just easily have drawn this as such, right? And that doesn't change anything. So now maybe it's a little bit easier to see that they're symmetric. Now the hydrogens on the ring are all going to be the same hydrogens also. Because there's another plane of symmetry that basically cuts the molecule like that. So really what's happening is we have one hydrogen in green that's unique and the set of methyl groups there that are unique also. So we should only expect to see probably about two signals for our uh, para-substituted uh, benzene ring. And we can continue our analysis, right? Let's just change it to here. Now we have an ortho substituted benzene ring. Again, hopefully we can see that the methyl groups are going to be equivalent, right? We can see that plane of symmetry that's cutting down through the middle there. But now we have a couple more unique hydrogens. So we have the ones in purple there that are going to be equivalent, and we have the ones in blue that are going to be equivalent. So we should expect to see three sets of peaks for our ortho substituted benzene derivative. So what does this really tell us? Well, if you remember way back about 20 minutes ago, I told you that NMR is basically there to put together the puzzle pieces. Now, aromatic rings are gonna show up quite often as structural motifs within organic compounds. And being able to distinguish between di substituted, whether ortho meta or para substituted di benzene rings, is going to be useful in NMR because we're going to see the different peaks show up, whether they're symmetric or not. So if you take a look in the green hydrogens on our para substituted versus the purple and the blue, they're going to show a different splitting pattern, a different set of peaks in our NMR spectrum. And that's going to help us determine what the structure of our molecule is. Because remember, at the end of the day, that's what NMR is going to help us uh, figure out, what the structure of our molecule is. So let's say we have this molecule, where we've got a, an ether group and several halogens coming off of a benzene ring. Now, if we go through, look through the previous slides, you know, we should be able to analyze and see where the unique hydrogens are on this ring. And I'll just highlight them there in a new color, right? So we should expect to see three signals. And indeed, that's, you know, if we had a generic sketch of what our uh, NMR should look like, we would expect to see one peak in red. Let me just put some numbers down here. Let's start at zero. Let's go down to about 10, right? Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So we would expect to see a peak for that methyl group, probably around three or so. So we'll put one peak there for our methyl group. And our aromatic protons tend to show up anywhere from the six and a half to maybe eight region. Uh, and so we would expect to see a peak there for our green and our peak a little bit lower for our blue. Right? And so I'll just connect all the lines. So if we were in
uh, the ideal world, I guess we would say. We would expect to see nice three uh, clean signals coming from those three protons right there. But in reality, it's a little bit more complex than this because hydrogens or your protons are gonna get split by the neighboring protons. And so here's what happens. If you go back and you look at some of the previous slides, we'll remember we talked about that our nucleus, our atoms can exist in two spin states. So if we're looking at our green proton, it, it can exist in those two spin states. And those two spin states there will affect the spin states of the hydrogen that's next door also. And so what happens is this, when the purple, right, if, if the, the green proton there, if it is in the up spin state, it's gonna change the, uh, the magnetic field or how strong the magnetic field is for the blue proton. So if it's spin up, right, if we just assume that we have a uh, external magnetic field here, then the purple spin state where it's up essentially makes a stronger magnetic field that affects the blue proton. If the green proton there is in a spin down state, right, it's going to reduce the external magnetic field, which is going to affect the blue proton also. And so what does that mean? Essentially what it means is that our green proton, depending on its spin state, is going to change the felt electronic field, right, the, the, the uh, perceived electronic field might be a better way of saying it, for the blue proton. So the protons next door are going to change the perceived magnetic field for the protons that we're looking at. And so what happens is this, since we have two spin states, what we'll end up seeing is that we will end up seeing a split for both of those protons there. So one is splitting the other one next door. And that's simply based off of the different spin states changing the, uh, the magnetic field. And so if we go through and we can start to uh, make more complex molecules, we will notice that the splitting is always gonna be equal to N plus one, where N is the equal to the number of neighboring hydrogens. So if we're looking at our blue proton right there, let me just clean things up a little bit here. If we're looking at our blue proton there, we have one hydrogen next door in green, right? So N is equal to one, right? And so one plus one, we would expect to see two peaks. And so we would call this a doublet. So we have one group of signals, right? We have one group of signals that has two peaks. So we'd call that a doublet. And so we could do the exact same analysis there for the green proton, where we would look next door, we see that we have one hydrogen, n equals one, one plus one equals two, so we would see another, whoops, we would see another set of doublets. Now for the red hydrogens, there is nothing next door, right? The next door is an oxygen. Oxygen is not going to affect the magnetic spin or the or the uh, perceived magnetic field of those hydrogens. So they will show up as a singlet because for here, n equals zero. So zero plus one equals one. So we have a singlet. So when we're talking about spin, spin splitting, we're talking about looking at the hydrogens next door. And that's the key important part here. The splitting pattern, whether it's singlets, doublets, triplets, quartets, that's going to tell us how many hydrogens are next door. And it's all based off of this idea of having two separate spin states when you're in a magnetic field. And we will do a couple examples. But the key important thing, n plus 1, and, and recognizing that the splitting pattern is going to tell us how many hydrogens are next door. With respect to NMR, integration is going to tell us the number of hydrogens that are present at a specific hydrogen environment. So integration in NMR is similar to what we expect or what we have learned in one of our math classes. It's just the area underneath a curve. So let me make a generic NMR spectrum here and put some reference points. Okay, so let's draw an NMR spectrum here. We'll start at zero. Let's say we get to two and we hit a peak. All right. And we keep going and we get to four 
make that a little bit sharper there and we get to four and we have another peak so integration in here is basically we are just looking at the area underneath that curve underneath those peaks there so the purple and the orange shaded areas and remember that is going to tell us how many hydrogens are existing at where that signal originates from so how many hydrogens are at where that signal originates from now there's two ways to tell integration one we can have the computer actually measure the area underneath those peaks and it'll come up with a uh, number for us but if we don't happen to have that we can kind of eyeball the integration by saying what is the relative height of those peaks and if we use a little bit of imagination we could imagine and we can see that if we maybe stack two of those orange peaks it gets to the height of that purple peak so we would say that the integration in here would be uh, it takes um, you know uh, uh, one for every one of these orange hydrogens right we would have two of those purple hydrogens right because we need to stack two of those uh, orange peaks together right or they are half of the height of the purple peak there either way is just fine right so we can eyeball it or we can have the computer tell us exactly what the area underneath each peak is but the important part is that this is a ratio so the ratio is one to two so let me just erase that there just to, for clarity's sake okay so we have a ratio of one to two or we could have a ratio of two to four or we could have a ratio of three to six right all of these are the same one to two ratio we're just increasing the number of hydrogens at each location and so what is that going to tell us well integration is useful for telling us or starting to help us to piece together some of the puzzle pieces and here's what i mean let's say that we have an integration of three to six so what does that mean it means that in orange we have to have a carbon right and that one carbon or that one carbon environment has to have three hydrogens off of it if we have a single carbon with three hydrogens coming off it that is telling us that we have a methyl group somewhere now what does it mean if we have six well with six hydrogens there's a couple different ways you could do it but what it might mean right remember we're just guessing at puzzle pieces at the moment it means that we could have two methyl groups right two symmetric or symmetry equivalent methyl groups two methyl groups would give us an integration of uh, six so we could go through and we could start to piece together some of the various puzzle pieces that we have based off of our integration if we have an integration of three it's probably a good signal that we have or excuse me it's probably a good sign that we have a signal coming from a methyl group if we have an integration of six it might mean that we have two methyl groups around now that's not the only thing right i'm just saying that is a, a a line of thought that we could have and so we could go through and kind of make some guesses of what each one of these integrations means right if we have an integration of two right that means we have to have a carbon with two hydrogens on it right that's one way of getting integration of two right so that's indicative of maybe a methylene group a ch2 group and then with an integration of four right it sounds like we have maybe two equivalent methylene groups somewhere on our structure right and then integrations of one and two right we could make similar arguments with that also so at the end of this what i want to say is that integration is a ratio right it is telling us how many hydrogens are at a unique location right or at our at our all the unique locations together in that one molecule and so what you need to do is once you have your integration you need to start to identify your equivalent hydrogens and your equivalent positions and that's going to help us match up our integration and where our signals are coming from So let's start to practice some NMR spectrum. So let's do the NMR spectrum for ethyl acetate, a very common solvent that you will be using in lab. So first off, if we have the structure, right, we can go ahead and start to identify where the chemically equivalent uh, hydrogen should be. So we should have a methyl group here, 
in purple. We should have a methylene group, a CH2 group there. And it looks like we will have a methyl group here at the end. Okay, so we've got three sets of unique hydrogens that we have to deal with. So we're gonna have to think about this, okay? So we're, there's a couple of things that we need to do to be able to draw the NMR spectrum from this. So we're gonna be working a little bit in reverse. We're gonna take the structure and then we're gonna draw what we think the NMR spectrum should look like from it. All right, so now we need to think about this. Let's start with the purple one. So the purple, right, in the purple here, we have to look at how many hydrogens are next door, right? How many hydrogens are adjacent to that methyl group there? And the answer is zero. So we should have a singlet, right? N plus one. If N equals zero, so N plus one equals one. So we should have a singlet coming from that group right there. In red, right? And the next door, right, is equal to two. Right, so n plus one equals three, so we should have a triplet. And here we have four, three next door, so n plus one equals four, or a quartet. So we should expect to see a singlet, a triplet, and a quartet. Okay, so let's start to put this together. Now, we have to look at where the relative peaks are gonna show up. Which one's gonna be the furthest downfield? which one's gonna, or I should say, which of those three sets of hydrogens are closest to the most electronegative atom? And that's gonna be your one in blue. So your blue is gonna be furthest down field. So your quartet is gonna be furthest down field. I'm just gonna pick an arbitrary place, right? Let me draw that a little bit better here. We're gonna put a quartet around four, okay? So we have a quartet, a set of four peaks around four coming from our blue. Now we have to say what is the next closest thing to our electronegative atoms, and that's gonna be the ones in purple because they're right next door to a carbonyl carbon, right? And so they're gonna be a little bit de-shielded. So we're gonna move up field a little bit to find a singlet from our from our uh, purple set of carbons there, excuse me, purple set of hydrogens, and then all the way up field, we will find a triplet. From our uh, red hydrogens there. So we would expect to see something like this, a triplet, then a singlet, and then a quartet. Now, what's the integration gonna be? Well, the integration should be about three, right? To three, to two, right? That is the smallest ratio, that the smallest whole number ratio that we can make from our, uh, from our compound that we're dealing with. So it might be useful when you begin to practice to know your compound and then predict what your NMR spectrum is gonna be from that. So identify whether you're gonna have singlets, triplets, and quartets right and then identify where the most electroneg or which group is going to be closest to the most electronegative set of atoms that's going to be furthest downfield or d shielded right and then draw a predicted spectrum from that let's walk through another example we'll do two butanone so if we're starting here the first thing we want to do is identify unique hydrogens. So we want to identify where the unique hydrogens are. And let's go ahead and draw those in. So hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. Those are chemically different. And this one here is chemically different. The second thing we want to do is predict our splitting, right? our spin, spin, splitting. We want to look at our next door neighbor, identify what's going to happen. So here's a singlet. This here is going to be a quartet. And this here is going to be a triplet. After we do that, we want to 
find most downfield or most D shielded, AKA the thing that's closest to the most electronegative atom. So here we have two things, right? We have our singlet and our quartet, our purple and our green, that's gonna be downfield. So at the moment, since we're just predicting this and drawing it, we don't really know which one of those is gonna be downfield necessarily, right? It's, they're probably gonna be pretty close to each other. And if you do look at the NMR spectrum, you will see which one is more downfield. So I'll just tell you for the moment that the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the quartet is going to be further downfield than the singlet is. So we will go ahead and start with our quartet. We'll draw it at about, oh, let's say, uh, let's draw this one at about three. So we got a quartet. So two in the middle, one on the outside for our peaks. We'll bring in our singlet then. It should be pretty close. Right, and then our triplet's going to be further upfield. So small one, big one, and small one. And then we can just connect everything. So we should expect to see an NMR spectrum that's somewhat similar to this. Our integration then, the last thing we can do is predict integration. So we should expect to see an integration of three for here, three for there, and two for there, right? And that is the smallest ratio that we can make for this uh, molecule. Let's continue with our practice. So a very similar compound to what we had on the previous slide. So let's analyze this. Let's see if we can draw the spectrum from this guy here. Find our unique hydrogens, draw them in. Do yourself a favor, right? If you're trying to predict an NMR, just do yourself a favor and draw in the hydrogens. All right, let's start to work on our splitting. We'll start in the red. It's got two hydrogens next door, so we should expect a triplet. In blue, here we have something that's unique. All right now we have five hydrogens next door, so we have a sextet. Okay. In green, we have two next door, so we should have a triplet again. And in purple, we have zero next door, so a singlet. And now we have to go through and analyze, you know, what's downfield and what isn't downfield. So we're gonna have our green ones that are furthest downfield. And again, we don't necessarily, can necessarily predict exactly where, but uh, just take my word for it for the moment. So we'll put our triplet furthest downfield. Okay, so we got our triplet. Then our singlet's gonna come next in purple. All right, so probably not too far away from our uh, triplet there. The next closest to the our electronegative there is gonna be in blue, so now we gotta try and draw six peaks. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, and then all the way at the far end, we've got another triplet. So one, two, three. So we should expect to see an NMR spectrum that looks like that. So what's our integration gonna be? Well, we have three here, we have two here, we have two here, and we have three here. So that's our smallest integration. So we should expect to see a three to two to three to two. So a two to two to three to three, whichever way you wanna look at it. And remember, our integration tells us how many hydrogens are at that unique location. And our splitting tells us what's next door. So what's interesting to point out here or a common puzzle piece is where we have a splitting that looks like this, where we have a sextet, which means we're next to a methyl and we're next to a methylene with an integration of two. So this is a common puzzle piece. So pay attention when you see this kind of splitting diagram with that kind of, uh, with that kind of integration, okay? So let's do some practice where we go in the opposite direction. So now we have an NMR spectrum and we wanna go back and figure out what the structure is. So here's a typical example. 
So we need to know a couple of things before we can start to uh, uh, start to predict an NMR spectrum. We usually need to know the formula. So the formula in this case is going to be C3. Right? We're going to have H6 and Cl2. So C3, H6, Cl2. So we'll talk about it a little bit later, and you'll learn about it in your lecture, what it means to be deficient in hydrogens. But there are no hydrogen deficiencies in this molecule. So basically what I'm talking about with hydrogen deficiencies is there are no rings. So there's no rings, no double bonds. So when you're looking up, remember your information about hydrogen deficiencies is very important. And remember, your halogens essentially act as a hydrogen when you're dealing with hydrogen deficiencies. So what this tells us here is that we have a, a simple uh, alkyl structure, right? an alkane structure. No alkenes or alkynes or any of that kind of stuff. So we have a couple different options. And so for a simple molecule like this, you can start to kind of guess at what the structure is. Okay, but let's not guess. Let's use the NMR spectrum to figure out what it is. So we know our formula. That's one thing we have to do. We checked our hydrogen deficiencies. That's another thing, right? And what we need to know then is our integration. So our integration for this molecule is going to be 2 to 1. So 2 here, I'm going to put it in green. So 2 here to 1. Now remember, our this is a ratio. So let's pause here for just a second. Our integration is 2 to 1. So if we just assume we have two hydrogens and one hydrogens, that's 3. But recall, we have six hydrogens that we have to deal with. So one of our steps should be to have our integration match our total number of hydrogens. So in this case, it's pretty simple. We'll just multiply everything by 2, right? So we should have 4. Let's get a different color. So we should have uh, 4 to 2 with our integration, right? So we did everything times two. So we should have four hydrogens here and two hydrogens here. Now we can start to piece things together. So let's take uh, what our integration means and start to uh, think about that. This means that we have to have a single carbon that has two hydrogens coming off of it. That's a fairly common uh, puzzle piece, right? That is a methylene group, right? A carbon with two hydrogens. Not too bad. What does an integration of four tell us? Now we can't have a single carbon with four hydrogens on it because that would be methane, but what we can do is have two methylene groups that are chemically equivalent. Right, so an integration of four tells us we have two chemically equivalent methylene groups. So what this means, what this means right here is we have to have a symmetric molecule. So we have to have a nice symmetric molecule. Two methylene groups have to be the same, one has to be different. Now, since we have the formula C3H6Cl2, let's put carbon bound to a carbon bound to a carbon. We know the carbons have to be bound together. There's no other way to do it with this formula. Now, using our puzzle pieces, we know two of these carbons have to be identical and one has to be different. Right? I'm just basing that off of what we learned from the integration. So two have to be identical, one has to be different. The only way we can do that is by making the one in the middle unique and making the ones on the outside different. Right Now the green ones have to be identical to each other, which they are at the moment, but all we're missing from this is our chlorines. Right? So let's put in our chlorines. So here's our first guess at our structure. Now that we have a guess at the structure, let's see if we can predict what the NMR spectrum from this is going to look like. So we can see, let me make a mark in red here, we can see that in red, right, we've got that internal plane of symmetry. So half the molecule is the same as the other. So the way we have it drawn, the green are the same, and the orange is unique from the green ones. So how, what would the splitting pattern for this look like? Well, looking at the orange, how many are next door to the orange? Well, we have two here, and we have two here. So we should expect to see a quintet of peaks 
So do we see a quintet of peaks anywhere? Yes, right here. We see one, two, three, four, five. All right, so there's a quintet right here. For the green, remember the green are identical. So how many are next to one of these sets of green identical hydrogens? Well, there's only two next door. So we should expect to see a triplet. And indeed, the other set of peaks that we see is a triplet. So now we can predict what the NMR spectrum is going to look like based off of what we drew, and our prediction matches what we see in the spectrum that we were given. So we have the correct NMR uh, spectrum for our molecule that we have here, the 1,3-dichloropropane. So here we have an NMR spectrum for C2H6O. Again, a fairly simple molecule, but there's a couple of nice puzzle pieces to pull out of this. So it gives us the integration already there in the green, 1 to 2 to 3. So we've already accounted for all of our hydrogens. So let's see if we can predict this NMR spectrum just using what we've noticed uh, in previous patterns. So here's something important to pick out. An integration of 2 with a quartet, an integration of 3 with a triplet. That is indicative of an ethyl group. That's going to be a very common structural motif. So an integration of two with a quartet, integration of three with a triplet, that's usually a good sign that we have some kind of ethyl group. Because there's not many ways that we can get three and two hydrogens together in that splitting pattern aside from an ethyl group. Now an integration of one, and we see that that one hydrogen, this guy right here, is very, very far downfield, right? It's almost down at five. And that's a likely indication of where we expect to start to see some alcohols show up. So granted, we have a very simple molecule, but just looking at some common splitting patterns, we can predict what the structure for this is going to be. So an integration of one with a very far down field uh, uh, um, um, signal is likely where we're going to start to see alcohols. And then ethyl groups are we have that integration of three with a triplet, integration of two with a quartet. So those are some puzzle pieces to start to pay attention to. And remember what I mean with puzzle pieces, that these are common things that you're going to see over and over again. Let's continue looking at some examples of NMR spectrum. So here's the structure, and here's a more complex NMR. So let's start to see if we can assign peaks and locations for these hydrogens. So first, let's take a look at the NMR uh, spectra for the aromatic hydrogens. So as always, fill in your hydrogens and find the unique ones. So remember, now the green make one set of unique hydrogen locations. So what we're going to see here is that we have one hydrogen next door to the green in the blue. So following our n plus 1 rule, we should expect to see a doublet. And the opposite is true also. So there's one next door to the green. So we should expect to see a doublet. So in the aromatic region of our hydrogen spectrum, we should expect to see two sets of doublets. Now, if you take a look at the list that we have in your textbook, or if you find one online, we see that typically aromatic hydrogen show up anywhere from the 7 to 8 region. And indeed, if we take a look down here, we should here we see the hydrogens showing up in the, um, uh, the aromatic region with the green and the blue there showing up as doublets. Now, the reason why aromatics show up down there is because the delocalized pi system in a benzene ring is really de-shielding those hydrogens. And I won't go into the explanation for that, just take my word for it for the moment. The way the aromatic pi system works, it ends up de-shielding. Now, that also works, in a manner of speaking, for, pi, uh, for any pi bond. 
So if we take a look right next to the aromatic system here in purple, it's already explicitly shown in there that hydrogen that is on a double bond, an alkene. Alkene hydrogens tend to be further downfield also because of the way that pi system works and it's deshielding. So if we take a look at that purple hydrogen, there are no immediate hydrogens next door. So we should expect to see a singlet that's further downfield. And indeed, we see that small peak down there at about, let's say, oh, about maybe 6.1. Now we have to deal with all of our methyl, uh, all of our methyl hydrogens. So here we have a T-butyl group. Oops, let me, sorry, didn't want to do that in the same color we've already dealt with. Here we have a T-butyl group. So we should expect to see a large peak, right? We have nine total hydrogens in that T-butyl group, and there are no immediate hydrogens next door to any of those methyls. So typical T-butyl groups are a large peak with an integration of nine or three, depending, right? A large singlet. And that is indeed what we see over here, very close to the, uh, uh, about 1.4 there. So we have a large, uh, singlet that is a in a shielded region typical of alkyls that's indicative of an of a t-butyl group the last thing we have to deal with is our um, our hydrogens here on the methyl groups and we will expect to see that you know they are close to that pi bond so they're going to be a little bit further downfield but still not too de-shielded so we expect to see those here uh, close to where we see most of the alkyl groups show up. So there are no immediate hydrogens next door to those hydrogens in black. So uh, again, we expect to see a singlet and we expect to see it a little bit lower because it is, doubly, it is next to that double bond. So let's take a look at a molecule that's going to give us some useful information with very common indicative NMR peaks that we will see. Remember, what I'm trying to show you guys in this lecture is common puzzle pieces that we can put together, or repeating patterns of NMR diagrams and splittings and peaks that we will see over and over. So first, when you get an NMR spectrum, take a look at the range that we're looking at. So in our example here, we're looking all the way from 0 to 12. Remember, the higher the number, the higher the ppm, the more de-shielded or downfield our hydrogen is. We see that there's a peak uh, that's past 12, um, and that is a region that is almost exclusively going to be where carboxylic acid hydrogens show up. And indeed, we see one carboxylic acid hydrogen here in purple. And so that is that hydrogen there. Now, another thing to notice, and this is subtle, but as you start to look through examples, you'll start to pick this up. The actual peak for a hydrogen on a carboxylic acid is more broad than all the other peaks that we see in this particular spectrum here. Now, broad peaked NMR spectrums usually come from acidic hydrogens. So most commonly, where we're going to see broader peaks is things like alcohols or carboxylic acids. Amines tend to give broader peaks. So not only the location of the peak, but also the shape of the peak. And what I mean by broad, it's, it's if you pause for just a minute and compare the peak in purple there versus the one that's around 10. If you take a look at the base of the peak, it spreads out more. So we have a broader shaped peak, and that's what I mean. So also take a look at the shape of your peak when you're going through and looking at your NMR spectrum. The next indicative peak we can take a look at is one that's sitting close to 10. A very sharp, tall peak uh, around 10, that is the region where we most often see aldehyde, where we most often see aldehyde hydrogens showing up. Oops, there's a stray mark there, apologize for that, where we start to see aldehyde hydrogens show up. So a peak around 10, that's sharp, usually means an aldehyde. So now we take a look at the aromatic region. Now if you take a look at the the works, or excuse me, the sheet that I post online, which kind of lists out the common regions where we expect to see NMR um, signals show up. We know that between about six and a half to eight, that's where we tend to see our aromatic region. Now, the reason for this is because the delocalized pi system in an aromatic ring tends to deshield the hydrogens that are bound directly to the aromatic ring.
So in benzene rings and other aromatic systems, these tend to be pushed lower or downfield because of the, um, the delocalized pi system. Now, if we are just looking at our aromatic region here, we see three sets of peaks, right? So we see three sets of peaks here. So what does this tell us? Remember that how many peaks we have is going to be telling us how many hydrogens are in that environment, right? How many unique sets of hydrogens exist in this molecule? And so if we see three unique sets of hydrogens within the aromatic region, it's telling us that there have to be three hydrogens that are on this ring, right? So if we just start by labeling these one, two, and uh, let's use, let's see here, we've got a dark blue, that'll be fine. So one, two, and three. That tells us that there have to be three hydrogens on this aromatic ring which really is telling us that if we have three hydrogens on the ring, there have to be three non-hydrogens coming off the ring. So we have a tri-substituted benzene ring. So what I'm saying is take a look at how many peaks you have in your aromatic region, and that's going to help you to tell how many things you have coming off of our benzene ring itself. Now, if we want to try and assign which of those peaks, the one, two, and three, go to which hydrogens, we can do some basic analysis and make a very educated guess. The further downfield, the further downfield hydrogen is likely going to be that one in red there. And it's kind of tucked between those electron withdrawing groups on the ring. Uh, number two is likely going to be this one here, which is the second one closest to the electron withdrawing aldehyde. And number three is likely going to be this one up here. Oops, I meant to write a hydrogen, not a three. Okay, so it's likely we're matching up those three hydrogens at those three positions there. So in recap, look at your aromatic region, count how many hydrogens there are there, count how many peaks there are there, and use that information to piece together how many things are coming off of a benzene ring. We're going to move up just a bit. We're going to look at this small set of peaks that is sitting down here. Let me get a new color, a light green. So let's take a look at this set of peaks right there. Now right now it just kind of looks like a blob. If you manage to zoom in close enough what you would see is that it is actually a septet. So this is a septet. So a septet meaning there are seven peaks and if you have the information you would see it has an integration of one. If you have a septet with an integration of one there's really only one feature that can have that and that's an isopropyl group. Specifically, it's that central hydrogen in the isopropyl group. Remember to have a septet, it means you have to have six hydrogens next door. Right? Six hydrogens next door can only be done in two ways, either with two methyl groups or three methylene groups. The three methylene groups being far less common than the two methyl groups. So a septet with an integration of one, it's showing that central hydrogen in an isopropyl group. Now, if you have that central hydrogen isopropyl group, you better have the other part of the isopropyl group, which happens to be this peak over here, which is a doublet, and it has an integration of six, right? So that is these sets of hydrogens coming off of the methyls from the isopropyls there, okay? So our doublet with an integration of six and a septet with an integration of one. These are the two puzzle pieces that go together to make an isopropyl group. And the last thing that we need to look at, uh, let's see what color we can still use here. Looks like I have a dark red. Is that dark red set of hydrogens, which should show up as a singlet, which is that large peak there that's downfield near four. It is an alkyl, uh, carbon there, right? A methylene carbon, but it's very close to that carboxylic acid, so it's going to be further downfield with respect to where we normally see alkyl groups show up. So in summary, this example molecule here is going to try and show you a lot of the common structural features that we see. Aldehydes, carboxylic acids, aromatic rings, isopropyl groups, right? All these things which will show up over and over. So take a moment, see if you can follow along with how I identified each one of these hydrogens and see that you can kind of commit to memory how we go through and analyze these.
let's start to look at a more complex compound and some of the intricacies that might happen with NMR spectrum. So a couple things to notice here. First of all, um, we aren't explicitly showing the stereochemistry, but notice there are a couple of chiral centers that are present in this molecule. But just to keep things as simple as we can, we're not going to be looking specifically at what happens with different um, uh, hydrogens in these chiral centers. So, but what we will be doing is let's look at what happens if we have some very closely related hydrogens. And so let's start by looking at the simple things first, and then we'll move to the more complex. So starting over here on the left, we see two hydrogens, which will essentially be in the same environment. Those two sets of hydrogens there on the methyl groups at the end, we expect to see those in fairly similar locations. And in fact, we will see those here uh, at those sets of singlets there. Now, if you'll notice, those sets of singlets there are actually separated because what we haven't talked about necessarily yet is that, remember, these hydrogens, while they are the same methyl groups there, a double bond there is not allowed for free rotation, and so they're going to be close but not exactly the same. So there is a slight intricacy that can happen here where we have double bonds, which locks some rotation, which prevents these hydrogens from being in exactly chemically equivalent positions. So we do see these two hydrogens that are actually split into the two separate sets of singlets right here. So we have to pay attention that sometimes our double bonds tend to cause a difference between our equivalent hydrogens. Now it doesn't matter too much for us because there is no hydrogen next door to either of those greens, so we just expect to see two of those methyl groups getting uh, shown as a singlet with an integration of three, and we tend to see them a little bit further downfield because they are next door to that pi bond. So just pay attention that sometimes our double bonds might cause us a little bit of a problem. We'll continue looking at our next methyl group. Let's look at this guy here at the end. This one should be a little bit easier. Here we do have a methyl group that's next door to a single hydrogen. Let's put that in there in orange, right? So they're next door to a single hydrogen. So we should see those blue hydrogens getting split into a doublet, right? So a doublet. So we're looking for a methyl group. A, uh, that's split into a doublet that's upfield. So that's the only likely location that we can assign those blue set of um, hydrogens. There's another methyl group that's sticking off at the end all the way up here. Next door to that, I'm just going to draw these in, but you know, it might look a little bit weird, but just for simplicity's sake, right? We have those purple set of hydrogens there that are next door to that methyl group. So we should expect to see a triplet that is upfield. And there we are with that set right there. So an upfield triplet uh, from that methyl group at the end of uh, the, the chain there. So now that we've kind of taken care of the easy part, let's go back through and let's fill in some of the more complex parts then. All right, so we have that hydrogen there that we have to deal with, right? We have the purple, we have the orange, and we have the light green that we have to deal with. So let's see if we can pick the easiest one from those to try and see if we can figure out what's going on. So if we look at the orange hydrogen there, right? So if we take a look at the orange hydrogen, it is next door to four hydrogens, the blue and the light green. So we should expect to see a quintet, right? It's next door to four hydrogens, so we should expect to see a quintet. And so that's where our, um, uh, uh, that's where the orange set of hydrogens is gonna show up. Now we have to pay attention to what's going on with the purple and with the light green. So let's look very closely at that purple and light green set. So the purple, right, is right next to the oxygen and that should get split into a quartet because it has three hydrogens next door. The light green is next door to the oxygen and it also has some unique hydrogens next door to it and that it also has, uh, let me put this in here. Whoops, let me pick a light blue. So not only does it have that light blue hydrogen, it has the orange next door to it. So we should be expecting to see that split into a triplet 
but since it is also next door to the oxygen, just like the purple, what happens is that the purple and the light green actually start to split or they start to show up in the exact same position. And so we have a very complex splitting pattern that starts to show up. We have the, the uh, light green splitting from the blue and the orange, and we have the purple splitting from the red that basically starts to overlap into what can best be described as kind of a blob of peaks. Now, if we could zoom in on there, we could see that we have a, you know, a doublet of doublets, and then we have a, a quartet that's also kind of overlapped in there. And so we have a lot of different splitting patterns that are starting to show up in uh, the, uh, the region there that we have the light green and the purple. So unfortunately, what does happen sometimes is that if we have hydrogens that are in very similar environments as with our purple and with our green their peaks start to show up on top of each other and so it really starts to become kind of a convoluted splitting pattern in there so just to pay attention that sometimes things aren't always as simple as they might appear the last thing that we need to look at is our light blue our light blue hydrogen there is just next door to our light green, so we should just expect to see a doublet from there, and that's where that one shows up. Remember our alkene hydrogens, our alkene hydrogens, or vinyl hydrogens, are more D-shielded, so we should expect to see those downfield there. So in summary, what can we tell from this very complex molecule? What I could really say is that sometimes NMR is more complex than originally we really would want to think it is. We can have overlapping peaks, we can have problems with uh, methyl groups getting locked in position because of alkenes, which kind of uh, show in a different splitting pattern that we might initially expect. So just to quickly summarize, NMR can get fairly complex.